Good morning and welcome to the 18th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2019. And can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones? This morning we have David Torns substituting for Annabel Ewing. Uh, and agenda item one uh, is a consideration of whether to take agenda item four in private. Are we all agreed? Thank you. That's agreed. Agenda item two is the non-domestic rate Scotland bill. Uh, and we will take evidence on the non-domestic rate Scotland bill from two panels today. The first will be representatives of independent schools. The second will be representatives of local government. For today's first panel, I'd like to welcome John Edward, Director, Scottish Council of Independent Schools, Liam Harvey, Headmaster, St Mary's School, Melrose, Colin Gambles, Rector of Hutchison Grammar School, Martin Tyson, Head of Casework, Scottish Charity Regulator, Oscar. Thank you all for attending and thank you for your written submissions. And I'll start the questioning by asking if you could outline the difference between mainstream state schools and mainstream independent schools. Would anybody like to kick off? Uh, certainly. Thank there. you, Convener. Um, in, in our views, in terms of the education they provide, there's very little. That's, that's our point, is that uh, they are educational institutions like any other in Scotland. Um, some of our schools teach the SQA exams, some teach the IB, some teach to GCSE and A-levels, and some teach all combination of those, plus Steiner, uh, Curricula, Montessori, all sorts of other things. Um, the, only, the, the key difference between them is their management. Um, obviously, all local authority schools, all schools in Scotland, apart from Irish, with the exception of Jordan Hill, are under the control and management of local authorities, whereas our schools are very specifically under the management of independent boards of trustees, boards of governors. Um, all of our mainstream schools in Scotland are registered charities, so they are bound by the legislation that affects charities in terms of the independence of those directors and trustees. And it's the autonomy for the teacher, for the head teacher and the senior management in terms of the curriculum, in terms of the um, extracurricular offer and the management of the school, the size, the location, the curriculum, that really is the big difference for us. Thank you. Mr Harvey, Mr Gambles. I think it's a fairly good, good summary, actually. I mean, there may be details school by school. But... OK, thank you. Well, can you then tell me, when we had our, our meeting last week, we talked about uh, the mainstream school supporting, providing support to state schools. Could you extrapolate on that a wee bit? But what exactly is the support that uh, independent schools give to state schools and how it differs from... Well, the support goes... goes but the interaction goes both ways. Um, the, the schools, what the schools do in our case is, is part of their commitment to public benefit. Um, so they see, they take it very seriously in terms of what their role in the community is, both in a broader community sense, but also in an academic sense. So you may get subject sharing and, and teacher sharing. You may get the sharing of sports resources or coaches. Um, you may get the sharing of music events or careers events. Um, so it's not necessarily one sector helping out the other. It's just th those parts of the school system in Scotland working together as best they can. And by their very nature, a lot of our schools have a slightly different offer, different facilities, different opportunities, and it's trying to make the most of them. But of course, what changed in 2005 with the Charities Act was it gave them a specific obligation to make sure they met that public benefit requirement as registered charities. And so that changed the nature of the relations in terms of um, access to the schools, in terms of providing means-tested assistance, fee assistance to pupils wanting to access the sector since assisted places and all these other programs had ended in the past, but also in auditing their relations with the local communities that the schools sit in, which I'm sure my colleagues can say more about. The, does anybody want to say more about it? Mr. Add that, um, um, so we have a very good relationship with the local primary schools in Melrose. It's a small town, but we uh, we're often involved in joint ventures such as choirs that... Uh, that participate in charitable events and church events um, and practices take place on within our facilities which we, we're blessed with having a, a nice uh, assembly hall with uh, good acoustics so um, and that enhances the relationship between St Mary's and uh, Melrose Primary School for example and it matters to us and it matters to them uh, and we have a very good relationship with that school. 
Okay. Mr. Campbell. I think we find it very variable depending on the head teachers of the schools that are around us in Glasgow. So uh, we would like to do more, I would argue, but uh, when we we don't always find that that we find that easy. All right. Okay. I might want to bring Oscar in here in this as well. I mean, there is one of the issues is about a, one of the examples that was used last week at that, and a bit of put in record to, a thanks to George Watson's for hosting a, a very useful visit last week for the the committee and those who attended, including yourself, Mr. Edward. The uh, but one of, one of the uh, suggestions here is that you offer tuition for state school pupils and topics not covered in school that they're enrolled in. How is that different from state schools that offer that to other state schools that are that don't have that topic? Because I know that happens, for example, in Glasgow, and I'm sure else, uh, elsewhere in the country. Mr. Okay. Oh, please don't answer that. Um, one of the things that our sector prides itself on is trying to support more, if I call them niche subjects, um, in other words, ones where their our parental body expect that they we will provide the full range of the curriculum, and I know that includes su support for things like Latin or Greek, which are increasingly. It's I, I would describe that the state sector find those hard to support, and so we can provide uh, a breadth of curriculum and also a breadth of um, permutations within the curriculum that the state sector finds much harder to provide. Okay, does anybody else? John? Yeah, I mean, and, I mean you, see, you see it in subject teaching. For instance, at Watson's, they've obviously developed a big programme on Mandarin teaching, which they have built up in cooperation with uh, state schools in the south of Edinburgh, which simply one school on its own wouldn't have been able to do in terms of the of scales. And that happens in lots of places, as, as uh, Colin Gamble's mentioned. We see it in, in subject areas like economics, business studies, design technology, for instance, at Advanced Higher in Scotland, one of our independent schools uh, sits one third of all the Advanced Higher design technology exams in Scotland. So anybody wanting to do design, design technology who may not have the access to the laboratories or the facilities in their own school, there is that option. Um, so it is, to a certain extent, keeping the, the breadth of subjects open, but also it's a provision of more uh, uh, general academic opportunities. So uh, I think you may have heard from uh, Kilgraston School last week in Perth and Kinross. The, the independent schools in Perth and Kinross provide an enormous amount of arts, drama, sports provision for the primary school sector as well across the schools in Perth. Um, again, because they have the, may have the facilities or they may have a dedicated teacher or they may just have the background in that area. And it's, they see it as part of their purpose to extend that wherever possible. I wonder if I could ask Martin Tyson on that. Part of the the charitable status, I think that this has kind of like been one of the examples that's been raised all the time about the 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 support that independent schools give mainstream schools. But is that again not something that other state schools do? So it wouldn't necessarily make independent schools different from state schools in that way. Where it comes in for us is in the assessment of public benefit. So uh, when we looked, uh, when we reviewed the uh, charitable status of, of all of the uh, independent schools on the charity register uh, between 2007 and 2014, we looked at the total picture of public benefit that they provided. So that was looking at the benefit that they provided to their students, and that's generally uh, fee charging, but the benefit that they provided uh, in furtherance of education uh, to people out with their student body, uh, whether that's students from, from uh, other, you know, schools in the local area or otherwise, uh, that counts in terms of their uh, public benefit, and that uh, is relevant in terms of uh, meeting the charity test under the legislation. I'm just trying to get my head round this because I'm, I'm not... Uh, I'm not sure I'm really following this. If, if, so there, if a, if a state school, for example, a, a school that was in the, the state system just now decided to go independent for whatever reason, what, the work that they are doing just now in the main would qualify them for that? Because most state schools do exactly the point that you're raising just now? Well, if, uh, okay, if, if we had a, an application for charitable status from uh, a, a, a state school, uh, we would look at them in exactly the same way. Now, Presumably, they wouldn't be fee charged, and so that that uh, side of it as to whether their fees unduly restricted access to uh, the education they provide, we wouldn't need to think about that. But we would look at the whole picture of the benefit that they provided. Um, 
I, I, th I think the, 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 the issue here is our uh, test, you know, it, it's not a comparison between state schools and, uh, and independent schools. It's basically looking at the evidence of what a particular charity does uh, alongside the, uh, the tests set out in the legislation and seeing whether it meets those tests. So it's, it's, it's not based on a, on a comparison of, with, with other sectors. Fair here, I'm not really here to interrogate the charitable status, but I was just, I was trying to get that uh, uh, anomaly and clear my head. Uh, Graham, you wanted to come in at this point? Thank Very you. quick follow-up. So if, if an independent school is having kids in from uh, the state sector to, for example, st study Mandarin or Greek or Latin, do you charge for that? No. No. No charge. Not, not at Hutchison's Grammar School. And that, and that would be true of most of the use of, I mean, there will, there will be community clubs or sports clubs that may get charged a, a minimal rent for the use of facilities after hours or whatever, but um, in the vast majority of cases that I was looking into for the last five years, shared careers events, shared music facilities, shared subject teaching, none at all, no. Can I just add that there might be occasion when, for example, a pupil would attend St Mary's from a local authority school to be uh, taught by a peripatetic tutor. Now, the peripatetic tutor might charge a fee, but the facility would be provided free of charge by the school. Okay. Uh, can, can I just touch on the, the cost of rent? Are you saying that sort of like after four o'clock, if somebody comes in and rents your halls, they do it at no cost or minimal? Uh, how, how does your rent compare to the local authority charging for a let, for example? When it's Can I ask specifically on that please, one? Please, um, please, please. So really what we're doing is it's slightly above cost. I mean, it's basically the cost of our janitorial staff. So we're not looking to try and make a profit from it. We're not looking as a way, that's not a revenue generator for us. We want to share that facility with the local community. So it would be at local authority prices or less? I to say, I, I don't drink. really know what the local authority prices are, so I, I can't comment on that. <laughs> For instance, in the discussion in Edinburgh recently about about the, the rental of local authority provision, um, sports provision, it would be lower than that um, because it would be, as, as was mentioned, in some cases the janitorial costs or the utilities costs will be featured. I know in some schools they don't bother to, to top that up, so they'll just make sure that there's the, the access is there. Thank you very much. Uh, Andy, you wanted to come in? Yes, thanks um, very much for coming this morning. Just a few questions, one or two follow-ups. First of all, Mr Tyson, you, in response to a question about whether um, uh, a public school could become independent and get charitable status, presumably it couldn't because the charitable status is tied to the organisation, so a local authority cannot be a charity. Yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that's exactly right. Um, we, to be considered for charitable status, there would have to be a, an entity, so you know, the, the, the school itself would have to be a legal entity for us to be able to assess it. Uh, and I think that raises, it would raise a whole lot of questions about the relationship of the school to the local authority. Okay. Um, can I just pick you up on something you said in your evidence, um, uh, Mr Tyson? So I just want to understand this. You say um, on the second page, there is a possibility. So you're talking about the potential, the consequences of removing... Um, um, uh, charitable relief. There is the possibility that some schools may wish to request removal from the Scottish Charity Register under Section 18 of the 2000 Fact Act, in effect, a voluntary deregistration as a charity. You then go on to say, when a charity is removed from the register for any reason, it must still prepare and submit accounts to Oscar for any outstanding assets. This is because the assets still need to be used for charitable purposes, but not public benefit. I don't understand all that. If if any entity. Uh, a school or a, any charity says we don't want to be a charity anymore, presumably on a certain date after that, they're not a charity. That's right. Um, but, and, and they're removed from the charity register. Uh, however, uh, what uh, the Act does is provide for a bit of residual uh, protection for those charitable assets after they come off the register. So some of our uh, regulatory powers still apply to the assets that the charity had at the time that it came off the register, and it continues to be under a duty to apply those assets for 
uh, the charitable purposes it had. So if it was a school, they would still be under an obligation to apply those uh, assets for charitable purposes. What uh, wouldn't necessarily apply is the requirement to provide public benefit as defined in the Act. I don't understand why. Mm. How could charity... Are you saying that if somebody bequeaths a building... Mm that that building then retains its charitable status? No, the, the, the building has to be... You know, it, it, obviously, here, the, the, the relevant charitable purpose would be advancement of education. So if a building uh, had been in the possession of a charity for the advancement of education, they would continue to be required to use it for the advancement of education even after they came off the register, and they would continue to uh, need to report to us uh, on that asset uh, as long as it was uh, in their hands. I still don't understand. If you, if you like, it's, it's a sort of safeguard for charitable assets. But, but, it's, but that seems to endure forever. Well, I think it'll depend on the nature of the assets. Right. So if it's cash assets, well, it'll, it'll run down fairly quickly. If it's something like a, a van or a photocopier, again, the, you know, it'll, it'll endure for the, the, the life of the asset. If it's a building, yeah, it's going to have quite a long life. Oh, OK. Right. I'll maybe go to do some further reading. Um, are there any... In sorry, sorry, I mean, it was just to add to that, that, but the Scottish Government at the moment is consulting on an extension of, or a, an amendment to charity law, and that would, seem, that would aim to extend a public benefit requirement, as I understand it, as well, to assets that can, once they were no longer as a registered charity. So there would be an, an additional, if you like, responsibility on them. OK, so we might get involved in that in this committee in due course. Um, just a question, are there any independent schools that did not have charitable status in Scotland? There are a number of special schools that don't have charitable status. Uh, but uh, uh, to my knowledge, I think uh, all, all of the mainstream schools uh, have charitable status. At present, there are no mainstream schools, so 98% of the pupils in the independent sector are under registered charities. There is one school that is seeking to open in the summer, which is not a registered charity and has not sought charitable status. But um, as was suggested, probably half of the special independent schools that we work with are registered charities or sit under registered charities like Capability Scotland or the National Autistic Society. There are other ones who may work, for a, may work under a faith organisation or whatever, but don't. But they tend not to be members of ours as well because they their statutes require them to be very standalone in the work they do. OK, thanks. Um, and just picking up, Mr Edwards, on your evidence, um, you say under the question how the government has responded to the Barclay Review, in particular on those recommendations it has rejected in fuller part, you say the consultation did not address any of the wider context relating to independent schools, and then you go on to list that. Just for the clarity, what consultation are you talking about there? Well, there was... Actually, all of the process. So the, the Barclay Review itself called us in to give oral evidence and written evidence. Um, but um, as, as I think I intimated, there was no discussion about the impact that such a move might have on the sector or any ask for any data on the, the wider sector. And likewise, the only consultation that's been undertaken subsequently by the government was on the, their recommendations following Barclay. And again, that just took evidence, written evidence from organisations, but we weren't requested to provide, if you like, sectoral uh, details, nor was, like the meeting last week from the committee, nor was there any direct engagement with schools. So this is a, a criticism, if you like, of the Barclay Review and its aftermath up until the point the bill was drafted and introduced to Parliament? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not to criticise anybody as such, but to say that... The, you're, you're left with a, with a bill and a financial memorandum that talks about a move that makes no suggestion or no calculation of what the potential knock-on effects of that would be. And, our, and it, there may be entirely unintended consequences, but our, our clear evidence, I think, is that in speaking to the schools, um, is that there will be a knock-on effect in terms of the impact on the taxpayer, but also the impact on the schools. And therefore, to simply place it as a, uh, a revenue-raising exercise um, denies the other elements that might, might fall from that. OK, and just a further question on your evidence in this, these same bullet points. You say, it is a matter of public record through FOI that neither Oscar nor some departments of the Scottish Government are convinced of the wisdom of creating a small anomalous group of charities, etc. Um, you say it's a matter of public record. Is this FOI on the, in the public domain? Yes, it was. 
was uh, a request, I think, made by a journalist. I'm not sure which publication it was. So, so when you say it's in the public domain, you mean... Well, the FOI... Sits on the government's website. Submission is there. And Could you there are, provide there are a us with a, a link just to save us? Do you have that? I, I have it somewhere, yeah. So, and equally, yeah. there's a couple of news stories on the back of it. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Um, by that, uh, I think that was a uh, an FY request to Scottish government. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you, it would have you come out there in, in the usual way. Okay. Thanks. Um, so, Mr. Tyson, could you give us a? Let's say you have an independent school with six hundred pupils, seven hundred pupils. What would be the typical um, things that it does that satisfies you that it's a charity? So the, 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 there's a. A set of things uh, in terms of the charity test that it has to do. Uh, typically, the purposes will be to advance education, uh, and in most cases, they will advance education primarily by providing you know, education uh, to their pupils. Um, so they're, they've got a charitable purpose, uh, and they're, you know, they've got activity uh, in furtherance of that purpose. The other thing that we uh, would need to look at would be whether, if they're charging fees, those fees unduly restricted access to that educational benefit. So, you know, how much does it cost to become a, a pupil at the school? Uh, if those fees are high, what kind of help is there for uh, people who can't afford them? We would look at that. And we would also look at the rest of uh, what the charity did in terms of providing public benefit. And that's you know, the, the kind of things that we've already talked about here uh, in terms of access to other schools, you know, to pupils from other schools, to, to subjects, access to facilities, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we would look at the whole picture of their public benefit in furtherance of that educational purpose. Uh, <clears throat> you say the fees are not unduly restrictive. I mean... Over 90% of the population could not afford to pay the fees of a typical independent school, so are they not prima facie? Well, what, restrictive? what we look at there is what's the level of the fees and where um, you know, people uh, aren't able to afford it but want to avail themselves of the, the benefit that the, uh, the charity provides. Is there help for them to be able to do that if they can't afford it uh, out of their own resources? And what's the level of that help? Uh, and you know, there's a few principles to that. Uh, where the fees are higher, we expect there to be more uh, help, uh, you know, in the form of bursaries, discounts, etc., uh, for people to be able to get access uh, if they want to. Okay. And in your evidence, you say a number of independent schools are in marginal financial positions. What do you mean by that? Okay. Um, we get uh, annual accounts and re uh, trustees' reports from uh, all charities, including the independent schools, as we've looked at these. I think what's uh, the, 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 there's a number of things that, that, that are common across the sector. Um, there's uh, probably the majority of schools are running with uh, small surpluses rel relative to, to, to their income. A number of them are reporting uh, insufficient reserves, which is an issue uh, given that you know, kind of continuity of, of, of provision of education is, 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 a, is a real crucial thing for, for their beneficiaries. Um, and uh, in a number of cases, uh, rules are going down. Uh, so the, 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 I think the overall picture there that, 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 that's emerging from the evidence that, that, that we have is a sector that's, that's sort of managing but doesn't have uh, a lot of uh, cushion to deal with additional costs. OK, and just finally for me, convener, um, just coming back to the, the other point you made in Oscar's evidence that some schools may wish to request removal from the charity register, um, presumably that, so that this is so that they can pay the rates out of income that they might have deferred from providing the kind of benefits that give them a charitable status. Is that? I mean, this is speculation, but um, I suppose one. Uh, option there would be if they're re released from that uh, the, the requirements of the charity test particularly in terms of undue restriction in terms of, of the fee levels it frees them up to uh, you know look at, at, at charging at a different rate and, and look at uh, you know, different uh, levels of bursaries because that they wouldn't be subject to that uh, element of scrutiny from us uh, okay. the, the, w w one other point there uh, there's a whole lot of complexity around that because uh, rates relief isn't the only game in town here. Uh, there will be other uh, you know, tax liabilities and tax reliefs that a, a school would have to consider if it was doing that. 
and those aren't you know, really things I can comment on. Just on the issue of deregistration, I think it's important to say I don't know of a single school that would want to deregister uh, because they see their charitable status and their charitable purpose as being integral to them. And I don't know of a single school that would want to reduce the level of its means-tested fee assistance. So in that respect, it's, it's not a road anybody's looking to go down to somehow avoid their responsibilities. Quite the opposite, as I say. Unlike our colleagues down south, who took the Charity Commission to court to, to deliberately not be held to a test, the schools have embraced the test up here. And I, I don't know of anybody who would want to get away from that. OK, thanks. Yeah. David, do you want to come in? Thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, it's for Oscar. In your written submission to the committee, you say that allowing the creation of a two-tier charity sector with a single-tier regulatory reg regime could be damaging to the public's trust and confidence in both the sector and charity law. How could this be damaging? Can you expand on how it would be damaging to the public's trust? Yeah. I mean, our, our, our concern here is um, it goes to the sort of basis of, of, of what the, you know, the charity law in Scotland says a charity is. Uh, the, the, the sort of virtue of the system here is it's very simple. If you're on the register, you're a charity. Uh, and, you know, for a long time, the assumption has been that uh, all, you know, that re any reliefs, you know, tax reliefs, uh, race reliefs, whatever, uh, apply equally to all charities. That there aren't some charities that are more charitable than others. Uh, you know, it, it applies across the board. I think um, our concern, this is our, this is our main concern about this, is that we start getting uh, a, a sort of blurring around the edges of, of what a charity is and a, and a blurring around the edges of what the public can be confident and understand as to what a charity is. We, you know, just drilling down a bit here, uh, what we would have would be a system where you have a whole bunch of charities that are set up to provide education, schools, universities, colleges, uh, and there is one group from among that you know set of charities with the same purpose that start to be treated differently for purposes of rates relief that starts to be very hard to understand you start to get anomalies uh, and you know the, the at the level of principle it's not clear why you would do that thank you well, maybe just follow on for that because that that supposes the confusion issue in terms of the public so i have a 10 year old granddaughter that attends the local primary school. Um, what is the difference between my local primary school and a primary school within the independent sector? Uh, what makes one a charity and the other not? The rates bill, I can't remember what the rates bill is in five, but it's a lot of millions of pounds. And so the public perception of that is what is the difference? The difference is my granddaughter's in a, a class of 32. 32 plus. So I don't know, maybe you could tell me what the average class size is uh, in terms of the private schools. But what is that difference? And if I can come to the point that you make there, because the confusion already, I, I remember uh, when I was serving as leader of Fife Council, um, we had a really difficult budget round, and one of the directors in education came forward with a proposal to set up an arm's length school company in order to save the rates. Uh, now, there's quite a number of you who was already been set up in, in Fife uh, when David was, was in the administration, the, the uh, Sport and Leisure Trust, etc., saves about three million a year on rates. That's the only reason it was done. But the point being, had I not dismissed and, and, and made sure that proposal never saw the light of day, we could have come up with a proposal and said, right, we'll set up the five schools company arms left for the council and save tens of millions of pounds. Is that right? Can you see why the public got a bit confused around around this whole question? I, I, you know, I understand the comparison that's made between the, 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 the state schools and independent schools. I mean, obviously, our um, your priority is your know, charity law and the integrity of the of the charity sector and and the the, you know, the confusion uh, that would be created there. In terms of what you say about the the, the potential for an alio, I mean I think the answer is yes. We, we we would have had to look at that on its merits if if Fife had applied for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just coming back to your ten year old granddaughter, you know, and, and her class size of thirty two pupils, you know, 
no, St Mary's spans uh, the primary range and two years into the secondary range. But um, and I can speak for us only. But whether this is the case across the sector, we have an average class size of fourteen, but we have a pupil to adult ratio of seven to one. Now, if your granddaughter had a particular need, let's say for example she uh, suffered ADHD or what have you, that that matters hugely to that pupil because there will be uh, assistance available to her. And if needs be, we can facilitate one-to-one -one assistance for her in that class, um, which I think it, it's it's very much a part of what we do and what we believe we should be doing. And, and as I've said in my submission, I, I would wish that, that that kind of pupil to adult ratio and average class size was available to all children across Scotland and England, and in, in fact the United Kingdom. So. It, you know, it, there's a lot of, you know, it's, it, it makes it, what we do, it makes us special in a, in a way, in a regard. I understand entirely. The, I suppose the issue from the majority of the population whose kids go to the state school is why is, is Fife Council paying rates on that very large school my granddaughter goes to when a private school 10 miles up the road is not paying rates and they have a teacher-pupil or adult-pupil ratio of 1 to 7 and, and my granddaughter's 1 to 32. And, and that, that, I think, is for a public perception why they don't understand the difference here. Uh, you can imagine the tens of millions at Fife Council paying rates. If they weren't paying that in rates and putting that into education, then perhaps this, the class sizes and the, 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 certainly the adult pupil ratio would be, be, be much lower. So, for a public, I mean, do you understand from a public perception point of view, they say, well, why, why would, why would certain schools get rates relief when others don't? Sir, go ahead. I'm, I'm no expert on the rate system, but just coming along, I've done reading of the Barclay Review, and what it seems to me to state is that the purpose of rates is to raise money for education. It's, it says that in the review. And so I can't... I don't think that... It doesn't seem to me to, to be real money, but the Barclay Review talks about cycling of money, in that the money is the government gives the money to the schools and takes it straight back from them so that they never see that money. Whereas we... I, I don't think those schools should pay rates. I don't think any school should pay rates because it, the, the explicit statement in the Barclay Review is that the purpose of rates payment is to generate money for education. I, I mean, I've got the... The, 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 this paragraph that he states it, it's, uh, there are other reasons as well, but that's one of them, is, that, is to generate money for education. So no school should pay money in rates to generate money for education because it's nonsensical. And to then say that independent schools should as well is also nonsensical, just as it is with the universities. It's not the right... It's not the correct... Uh, reason to generate money because it's about providing education. That's why the rates are, are charged. And, and to pick up your point about perception, you're absolutely right. There, there is a lack of understanding, and it, some of it comes from the terminology. It's why we don't use the expression private because it gives the indication of somehow a private business wanting to stay on its own and be isolated from the rest of the sector, whereas independent speaks to the school's autonomy rather than their their business status. They are, by definition, because of what Oscar does, not for profit. They cannot raise a profit and they have no desire to. Um, Colin's point is well made about, about local authority taxation. If I speak to state school heads, which I do all the time, none of them know what their rateable value is because it doesn't matter to them. They, if their rateable value triples overnight or halves overnight or goes up by, ten, by fivefold, as our schools are proposed to, it makes absolutely no difference to that head teacher's recruitment of teachers of staff of buying equipment, of changing the subject choice, of any of the facilities or any of the offer that the school makes, because it is simply, as, as was mentioned, a cycle of money from general and local taxation going round. And our contention would be that, you know, there are, I think, 11,000 charities in Oscar's register whose purpose is the advancement of education, of which we are only 50. 
Um, all of them receive the same, and they do pay rates. They all pay rates. We all, pay, all these schools pay 20% in rates, all of which is new money into the system. It's not cycled taxation money. It is new money from parents every year. Um, the only, the, the anomaly in the exception in Scotland is not our schools. The anomaly is charging a nominal rate to state schools, when indeed that makes no difference to the financial decisions those individual schools have to make. I would say to you, it does make a difference in the sense that the example I gave earlier where the Deputy Director of Education in Fife wanted to take all the schools out and set them up as an arm's length company, that would have saved millions of pounds. Now, had, had, had that budget transferred in its entirety, then it would have made a difference because that money would have went to these kids. So, so it's wrong to say it doesn't make a difference, it's just a paper exercise, is what I'm suggesting. And that's why it would be difficult for parents where their kids are in class sizes of 30, 30 odd to understand that their school pays rates and the school along the road where a teacher pupil ratio of seven or eight doesn't pay rates. That's that's just a fact. Well, I'm sorry, I found the note that I was looking for. In the background to the Bark Review, it states non-domestic rates are a tax based on property which is levied in order to help pay for the very wide range of services that council delivers, brackets such as education, and then it goes on. So it seems to me to be, I, I can't understand why the state sector schools have to pay taxes the rates in their state, they shouldn't. I'm going, I'm, I'm going to move on, but yes. I, I think we, we acknowledge where I'm trying to get to in terms of the public perception and, and, and that part of it. Just to, just to yeah. confirm your, your, your point about, about that, that money, I absolutely agree. I, I, I think local authorities should have that money freed up. I don't, I don't understand why it's captured in a, in a, in a cycle. Um, uh, but it doesn't, in that respect, change the overall tax take of the local authority one way or the other. Our point is that if you change the taxation rate on these schools, it makes a direct and significant effect on them. Sorry, I'm going to let Kenny Gibson and Betty... Because it's on this particular issue because, uh, you know, all governments of all political colours have actually charged these rates because the rates on non-domestic properties, but rates aren't just collected from, say, Fife Council and handed back. They're collected nationally and recirculated based on a needs formula. So it's not actually quite accurate to say that the rates that are raised are immediately thrown back. So, for example, a local authority like Neast Renfrewshire, which is more prosperous than, say, North Lanarkshire, might actually put in more in, more in rates from its schools. But then Glasgow will probably put in more rates than just about anywhere else in Scotland because of its huge retail sector. You know, so, for example, people in North Lanarkshire and where I represent Ayrshire all come in, they spend their money in Glasgow. That keeps businesses going in Glasgow the money goes to a collective pot and then gets reallocated. So it's all done on a kind of national kind of um, uh, redistribution formula. So obviously if schools were, were, were suddenly not to pay rates in the state sector, there would have to be a, a reformulation of that, that formula. And that's an extremely difficult situation because every area in Scotland then complains about the money that it gets and it doesn't get. So that's a wee, just a wee brief explanation of that. More does, complex than, than it seems. What highlight is it highlights the questions around education and the different levels of provision of education in Scotland. But can I ask, you mentioned, I think it was Mr Tyson mentioned earlier, about, about bursaries uh, and the availability of bursaries. And could I ask, has any work been done to quantify the national figures relating to bursary provision in Scotland, the value of that bursary provision and the number of people in receipt of full or partial bursary provision? Um, <clears throat> when we uh, did the, the reviews of, of all of the schools, uh, we looked at that uh, and uh, I think we were looking at uh, figures of uh, averaging around 10% of schools' incomes going on bursary provision. Uh, we have done some, some work. It's, I mean, obviously, it's, it's information for the individual schools, but we looked at the situation before the charity test was brought in by this parliament and subsequent, and means testing fee assistance has more than tripled as a direct result of the bill that was brought in, indeed by the predecessor of this committee. Um, so in the area of means tested fee assistance, that's now in excess of about £30 million a year. Again, which is derived purely from parental fee income. It's not coming from anywhere else. And, um, 
And on top of that, there's probably about another 10 million in other forms of assistance, for instance, sibling discounts, staff discounts, or whatever. Um, but you've, the, the, the bottom line is that means-tested fee assistance is now, I say, tripled. And by my rough calculation, if you exclude the publicity costs and other things that are done in the higher education sector to attract people in, um, the per capita fee assistance that's given out to higher education is now roughly per capita the same as the independent schools fee assistance, the difference being ours is all derived entirely from parental fee income. That data is available. I think it would be useful for the committee yeah. to, to certainly have that. Um, okay. In a school, uh, a specific example? Yeah, I, I think just so. Yeah. When, when Hutchison's was set up in 1641, it was specifically for the education of 12 children, 12 male children, all orphans. We're now at a situation where we've got 40 pupils in our senior school who are paying no money at all, have a transformational 100% bursary, and we've got another 90 children who are on partial bursaries. And the, the ratios of that, about how we decide that, is actually we've taken a steer from Oscar because they have, uh, they have advised us that rather than trying to give solely to transformational bursaries, the money, the limited money that we have in the pot will be better spent by trying to make it available to uh, different strata of people who need different levels of support. So, we've, so we've got, in our senior school, we've got 850 pupils, okay. and so we've got about 129 who are on bursaries, okay, but 40 on, on transformational 100% bursaries. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, right, Graham? Thanks, uh, convener. Um, can I ask you what, what what do you think lies behind this move against one small part of the charity sector? Um, I, I'd love to know. Um, I, I don't think I don't think we we don't detect any any um, particular desire to single us out. I think going but going back to to the deputy convener's point, I think there is a a problem in general public perception is how the schools operate. The fact that the money they have is purely derived from what parents turn up with every uh, every term, most of which goes straight out the door in salaries or utilities. And therefore, and on the back of a couple of news stories that some education centres were paying 100 paying 100 percent rates and schools were only paying 20, that seemed to be unfair. Um, it comes back to the previous argument that. In our case, it's 20p in the pound new money on top of council tax and on top of income tax. So I think there was a, although it was an easy headline, I think it was a, it was a, it was a slightly simplistic way of separating out, as I say, 50 charities out of 23 and a half thousand on the reg charity register. Um, my, our, our confusion as an organisation is, why do that? after this parliament has specifically requested those same small number of charities to pass a public benefit test in detail, which no other group of charities was initially singled out for. Uh, if I may, um, I think it seems to me to stem from a misperception of our parent body. Um, so if I describe a typical parent's evening to you, we've got two parents arriving, pretty flustered because they're both working, their salaries, they are using them, they are both having to work to try and afford the education that they value so greatly. They don't want to pay that money, but they feel that they need to. And I don't want to go into that particularly. But what we see is flustered parents arriving, working hard. They're talking to me all the time about the challenge that the fees bring and the fact that they are feeling very squeezed, that they're approaching a tipping point where that that so you know that we've found it faced the challenges from the teacher's pension and also from the teacher's pay review that we are uh, obviously aligned to. And all of these things are making the, the fees, and it's £12,000 a year to, take, to, to send a pupil to our school, which is obviously a huge amount out of post-tax income, but our parents value education that highly that they wish to spend that money. But the, the tipping point is coming. Well, Mr Tyson comes in, just to pick you up on that, so do, do you, Mr, Mr Gambles, do, do you think there's a perception of the parents that send their kids to your school as they're all um, extremely wealthy, 
you know, turn up in their Range Rovers with a Labrador in the back, and they can well afford um, to, to to pay extra, and, and, and this will make no difference whatsoever to them. Who, it seems to be, you know, that they are truly affluent, but there are a great many who are really struggling to pay those fees. And we know that because we've got a list of pupils who we can't give bursary support to every year that we offer places to, and they cannot come to us. Okay. I think one of the things we should be careful of is that uh, you, you mentioned earlier on people who value education, who are, who are being squeezed to put their children through that, which kind of suggests that there's parents out there who don't value education no, as much as that. Not and not I know that's yeah, not what you meant, but that intention. certainly could be how it was perceived. And yeah. uh, I think we have to make it clear but that there's lots of parents who can't afford even that amount of money of course. that, that, uh, that allows them to get some support from you to get, to get their children. And school. that's where we try and broaden access to our bursary programme and try and publicise it so that everyone knows that they can come to our school and there, is, there are places there that we are trying our best. So we're strategically committed in our documents to raising more money for bursaries because we, ideally we'd be, we'd be needs-free. You know, that if we, could, if, we could save, if we could save away in a fund maybe £40, £50 million, pounds, we could start becoming a needs-blind independent school. OK, sorry again. So if you could ask, answer the original question, which what do you think lies behind this? I think looking back at the, the, the history of, uh, I think particularly our engagement with uh, this issue since the, the, the 2005 Act, the Charities Act, had passed, I think it's very clear to us that you know, there is a, um, a lot of uh, concern around the charitable status of the schools. Uh, that was acknowledged when the charity legislation went through Parliament originally, uh, and you know a, a lot of the, the uh, provisions of the charity test came out of that discussion, uh, and that is why we put uh, a, a lot of uh, of effort and resource over those years into looking very carefully and very rigorously at the charitable status of the schools to, to try and address those the, those concerns. Right. Um, we heard last week. Um, when we visited George Watson's and we met a, a, a range of schools there. Um, and indeed, it's come out in your uh, Oscar's evidence that some of the, well, let's say the smaller independent schools are on the brink. Um, you know, they're not wealthy, um, struggling. Uh, in your evidence, uh, Miss, Mr. Gambles, I'm not suggesting you're on the brink, but you you actually give us some figures of what, what this could mean to your school. It could be an increase uh, per year of £326,000. That's our calculations. That's our understanding of what it will do to the bottom line for us, yes. So do any of you think that schools could actually go under as a result of this? Most certainly. I think, um, yeah, with the employers' contributions... Um, increasing on us too that's added to our, our budgets for next year or that's going to be a dent in our budgets uh, in due course um, and I think it's just another hit that uh, is going to make things very very difficult uh, for schools to operate we we as a, a business have operated quite efficiently over the last three or four years at St Mary's but uh, again uh, just coming back to an original point we offer 15% uh, of our income to bursaries so we open our doors to as many people as we can financially accommodate. Um, it, 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 we have made decent surplus, um, and I think it's important that this committee knows that. We've made a decent surplus over the last three years, but our intention is to reinvest that into the community at St Mary's. We, we intend to put down a sports facility that will be available for, for all local authority schools to use. And actually, whether you're aware of it or not, the Scottish Borders Council went to the asymmetric week model which means that on a Friday afternoon at 12 o'clock um, children are not in local authority schools and it's our intention to welcome those people into St Mary's into a facility, into our facilities and actually provide them with expert coaching from our, our staff uh, and that would be free of charge but of course all of a sudden our plans have been put on hold because we are now staring at an increased bill uh, that is coming down the line at us. And so it's stifling our ability to widen our, widen our scope to welcome the community, welcome the Melrose community and the wider community into St Mary's. Can I just ask, to that, sorry, 
Uh, Graham asked a question about schools closing. Does anybody have any s a name of a school that they think are under threat? Yeah, well, I mean, our neighbouring school um, has just closed its senior school um, is that, is that after 150 years of history. Which um, well, it's, it's Craig Holmes School yes, who's closed which, which it. So, was so I'm, very, I'm very sorry. I don't like putting that on public record. Was a, small it, and, a small and specific school, was it? Yes. Like, yeah. So yes. A very. The committee heard last week from one of the, one of the attendees, yeah, who's yeah. who's been on public record from Hamilton College in yeah. Hamilton, which is a, a school goes back less than forty years that took over an old teacher training college. They have said subsequently in the press as well that they they would be close. We've in the time that I've been at SCIS, there's been pupil numbers haven't dropped much. There's been a lot of belt tightening in the sector, but the one thing that has started to happen has been changes to the structures of the school. So Craig Home. Um, others, uh, we Beaconhurst and Bridge of Allen closed last summer. Again, looking forward, the projections that boards have to do six, seven years in advance. Those two schools, those schools that you've mentioned, except for the Hamilton one, which is a completely different type of school from the, the, the mainstream, the, uh, were, they, are they, were they part of a cluster? Like so Craig Home, is that part of a cluster? Uh, well, uh, Craig Home uh, latterly did... Uh, and, and the junior school is still operating. It did seek to go into a, a connective uh, days trust with uh, Kelvin Side Academy, which is quite a unique model, um, basically to support each other. But generally, most of the schools are almost entirely standalone. There are two here in Edinburgh. Just merged. Well, no, they, they, they have closed the part of the school, and they, yeah. the expectation is that most of the pupils will go to one. But, for instance, in the case of Beaconhurst in Bridge of Allen, some of those pupils may have gone elsewhere to independent schools, but many will have gone back to the state. Um, Ham Hamilton College, who were raised, are not the same as Hamilton School in Aberdeen, well, my apologies. which closed Yeah, which closed a couple of years ago, St Margaret's in Edinburgh. So it, it, it does happen, yeah. yeah. Sorry, can I just add to that? that there are five standalone prep schools in Scotland, five remaining standalone prep schools in Scotland, and whilst I'm not going to name schools, I would... I would ask that the committee scrutinise the accounts of those five standalone prep schools, and you will see that three of them are under threat. Have much more to do with other things. Well, Oscar, have, you Oscar have looked at the accounts, haven't you? And uh, you know, it was in your evidence that you said that yeah. schools were struggling. The uh, previous point there, um, there is, you know. There'll be as many individual circumstances as there are schools, but I think that there are you know different groups of schools in different circumstances. Uh, clearly, you know where it's a, a boarding school, that's going to be a, you know in a different market, as it were, from uh, the the day schools. But uh, you know, rather than talking about schools being on the edge, I think w what we're we're seeing is is schools. Uh, or, or a lot of the schools operating without you know much in the way of fat to be cut. Uh, and and, and uh, you know th th there will be some difficult decisions to be made in terms of absorbing uh, extra costs. Marginal financial position. Um, you, you could say that's on the edge. Well, I, I, th I think it's 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 that that, that, that idea that, that there uh, isn't much to play with. Okay. I go round schools, speaking to their governing boards on a regular basis, probably two or three strategy sessions of boards a, t a term. All we've talked about for the last 18 months is money, um, not challenges of education in other respects. And I know for a fact that boards like Beaconhurst, looking ahead and taking their strategic decisions, had Barclay in mind. And of course, if you're giving means-tested bursaries to somebody in S1, you're committing to five, six, seven years of education. So if you're projecting yourself through to, say, 2025 and being told in 2020 your budgets are all going to go uh, haywire, then, then that does speed up the decision-making process in schools quite quickly. Uh, Kenny, you wanted to come in briefly on this? Chair Convener, I mean, this has always been an issue. First of all, we heard earlier on that there's a new school, a new pri a private, sorry, independent school going open this summer. But Alan Glens and St Mungo's in Glasgow went 
down the stank many, many years ago. There's always been uh, evolution uh, within the sector, mergers, new schools, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we, you, we're asking what, 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 is the, what was the point of all this, and I'm, we're going to be asking, obviously, the government directly on this, but it would seem, I think, to many people is that you're saying you should have charitable status because of your involvement with the community, but the schools in my constituency, none of which are independent, uh, also allow the uh, local community to use their halls and playing fields, swimming pools, and they have to uh, pay rates. But what, one of the issues we haven't touched on is that you choose who goes to your school. I went to Bell Houston which is near Hutchie, and we used to get all the pupils that were expelled from Hutchie, so if folk were taking drugs or were involved in fights or any other antisocial behaviour, they were effectively uh, dumped onto our school. So you, you're you able to select who you who you have at your school, and obviously there's a, a rigorous selection process, I understand. Uh, the fees are about, according to your own evidence, the fees that you charge at Hutchie are more than twice what's spent on a state pupil per average. But can I ask... Uh, what has been the impact of um, recent changes in teachers' uh, salaries and uh, pensions on, uh, on on the sector? I mean, for example, Hutchie, you said you're 850 senior pupils. What is the capacity? And so, um, in 2006, we had 1,720 pupils, mm -hmm. and now in we have um, we've now got 1,220. OK, is that a choice of the school or is that because there's an erosion of uh, people who want to send their kids there? What's, why is the reason so for that? The pattern that I would describe is that the parents still want to come to us. The pupils still want to come to us. Our educational standards are excellent and our results are excellent. The only thing that I can see is that the fees keep going up and that the tipping point is coming for more and more and more parents. Right, OK. So, um, so what you're... So have you done any analysis of what you think? I mean, you've said, for example, that uh, 47 children, 3.7%, um, to leave could leave an interstate sector. Then the state sector obviously has to fund them. There'll obviously, be economies of scale can't, uh, 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 in the state sector. But have you got any um, evidence that that that, that um, increase in rates, which I understand, if I if I do a wee, um, if I divide the 300 and you know. A twenty-six thousand pound rise among your eight hundred and fifty pupils, four hundred quid, whatever it's going to be. That's what an extra three percent almost on the fees. Have you got any um, information as to what impact that will have? Have you had any feedback from parents or pupils about that? Um, I, I believe a number of our parents have submitted to this very committee on this because they they are starting to understand. I think it's quite a a lot of our parents don't understand the import of they haven't picked up on it somehow. It seems to be a little bit stealthier, but those that are have written to you. Um, remember, of course, that from those 850 pupils, there are 130 who are on bursary recipients, so that we can't charge that money to them. We have to further subsidise them. So, again, it, it, it's bigger than it looks. And how do you choose these bursary recipients? How do you decide who comes to Hutchie on a bursary? Say, for example... You know, a thousand people in the kind of um, in the south side of Glasgow want um, who ha can't afford the fees want to actually send their children there. Uh, how how do you decide who get who gets in and who doesn't? So they? there's an entrance test, right? And then we rank people, right? And then on their performance in that test, and then there's it's a simple. We go to the person at the top and we say, "You need a hundred percent bursary here." Right, so when you say rank them on academic ability... They're yes, on, on their performance in that test. So it's a snapshot. So, so there's an argument, and there has been an argument in the comprehensive sector for many years, that that's effectively stripping out some of the better, more able, more capable pupils from the sector and, for example, the schools that a lot of us actually went to, you know. So and myself, so, so I was at state school myself. Indeed, yeah. so, there's an, so there's an argument. So that alone is an argument. Does that benefit the wider community to have some of the more ambitious uh, parents have their children removed? They may actually benefit their specific children, but what about the rest of society? But, and so that's an argument around just this ask you all, Yeah, Liam Harvey, you'll come in first. But can I just ask you all to answer... Briefly, please, because we have got a lot to go through. We've got another panel that's coming in after this. It's been a really, really interesting discussion, and I do hate to curtail it. I think it's important to come in here <coughs> because I understand exactly what you're saying in this reference to people being dumped on your school because they've been expelled from Hutchie or wherever. Actually, our means-tested bursary process um, 
we, we don't actually we, we screen children to to assess their level of need and actually I don't overlook the fact that we have a number of pupils at St Mary's who aren't coping in the local authority system because they have ADHD or perhaps they are slightly on the autistic spectrum and they need one-to-one -one assistance and actually don't overlook the fact that we provide and have in, in the past provided 100% bursaries to children who have been isolated, marginalised by their community because they have been disruptive in their local primary schools and they've come to us and we've done our level best done our level best to provide that pupil with a level of assistance that makes learning accessible to them whilst managing their conditions and managing and helping. So there's this assumption that we are creaming off the more academic pupils, we are creaming off uh, the more affluent uh, members of, uh, who come to our schools to apply for positions in our places in our schools. Don't overlook the fact that that's not the case. There's a much Can wider... I just ask in that point there that uh, is there any statistics available that would show the amount of pupils that, who, who receive a bursary not because of academic ability but because of their level of need? Such as uh, the, the it, it would be it would be slightly stuff. blunt, but we could put together figures that showed from schools individually in terms of the selection process. I mean. Uh, in purely academically selective schools, there, there are relatively few. Um, and when we talk about the pupil-teacher ratio, a lot of the attraction for the schools is precisely because there is a higher level of one-to-one -one learning support, for instance. Yep. Um, can I just... We also have a number of pupils who are high-functioning autistic and who are Asperger's, for example, who we know that the parents are coming to us because they are not coping in the state sector those children are not flourishing, and that is why the parents have come to us. Well, that, that's exactly the type of person I'm asking uh, about, Mr Tyson. Yes, just a, a general point. Uh, when we reviewed the schools and looked at their public benefits, uh, there's, a, there's a separation between uh, scholarships, which are usually awarded purely on academic merit, and bursaries, which are uh, means-tested. And what we gave the weight to was the means-tested bursaries that were you know, about need and ability to pay. The, the point that Mr Gibson makes was that the both of them have, uh, seem to have coalesced around uh, the entry to example schools like Hutchison. The uh, scholarships in that traditional model have almost died out in Scotland, apart from a, a nominal amount. Down south, you will still get people offered places on their ability and have fee assistance attached, which is something you simply could not do in our schools anymore. Um, so that, 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 has, that has changed the result of the test that this parliament passed. And I think the other point, coming back to Mr Gibson's general point about parents, is we are only 4.5% of the sector. So it doesn't matter how many pupils or parents there are in our sector. Um, it, you know, we say no disservice to the 95% in the state sector who do extraordinary things. Be about public perception. Yeah, absolutely. And, absolutely. and, and, that's and, very and there important. is. Very there is, briefly, Kenny, yeah. I need to move on. It's in North Ayrshire where I'm, I'm, I'm an elected representative. There are no private schools, but 29% of pupils in Edinburgh go to private schools. So the impact in different local authority areas is different. And I have to say, as I said last week, I'm not, I'm not against the private sector at all. If people want to spend their money on that, that's completely up to them. I know other people in the committee are against the private sector, but. Uh, but, but um, but uh, I think what the government is looking for is a level playing field, and that's what we're, we're debating whether, or, you know, that's what we're deciding whether or not the Thanks, where that where that should be. Graham, do you want to come back in? No, 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 I, I, no I need to move on. Uh, David, do you have any questions on this? You were going to come in. Right, thank you very much, Alexander. You, you've talked about the, the marginal funds that are available and additional costs that have many uh, schools are having to manage, uh, and. Many committee members have talked about some being on the brink. Can I can I ask about specifically the nursery sector? So can I ask how many nursery schools provided as part of the independent schools are likely to be affected by this uh, removal of the rates relief? Well, every, every one of them. Every one that provide that has that's nursery provision, and of course. What Barclay also did was extend 100% rates relief to nurseries, whether irrespective of whether they were profit making and privately owned, um, whereas we're taking away from those schools that have contained nurseries. Some schools have nurseries that stand alone and could claim a different rates relief. Um, but in every case, every school that's a nursery partnership or every school that has a, in, an incorporated nursery will be affected. Yeah. Um, yes, um, within five miles of my school, there are 33 private for-profit nurseries 
who will get 100% rates relief. Now, a quirk of where we put our door means that we are not eligible for that. So that, 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 that devastates the whole sector within your, your, your own sector? It, it does not. It is inconsistent policy, it seems yeah. to me. It, it, it does we are for education, up. they are for education, yes. they are for profit, we are a charity, yeah. but we should pay rates and they should not. Yeah, and, the, and, and that would be penalising your, your sector completely within the process. It, and it that would be, to me. You'd all believe that would be the case. Okay, can I, can I ask about the, 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 the relief that's maybe being, is being proposed for the specialist music schools? Uh, do you believe that that is appropriate? I think that's a question for the one specialist music school. Um, I understand, I think, the justification for doing so on the basis that um, that school, most of the places are allocated funding by the government. And so going back rather to the argument about whether state schools pay rates or not, it is all taxpayers' money in the end. Um, I assume that's the justification for doing it, because I'm sure every school, if they wanted to, could say that they'd make a huge commitment to music. Um, but I think it's the status of St Mary's in terms of uh, how... The, and I know there's been a piece of re legis regulation through here in the last couple of weeks about the fee levels there, that because the support is coming primarily from central government, that's why it's been accepted. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I would like to support what Mr Tyson was saying, that as soon as you start trying to Substitute. put different value on different charities, it mm. becomes very, very difficult. Yeah. So my understanding is that the music school is exempted because of they select on the basis of musical ability or potential. Half of our pupils in first year are taking music lessons. Yeah. And classes aimed at developing musical excellence, well, all of our pupils in first year are in music classes designed to develop musical excellence. Now, if you... If you'd like us to put in place a, a you know, a requirement that, that all of our children have to have an instrument, the parents would be delighted because they perceive that as a good thing for their so, children's education. But to do so would be precisely to go at the point about arm's length bodies. None of these schools are doing this or existing or educating because they want to avoid paying taxes. No. That's the point. They are paying 20% rates because they have been educating in the case of Hutchison's for hundreds of years. Thank you. Okay, me. right, thank you very much. Uh, Andy, you wanted to come in? Yes, yeah, just a few points <clears throat> to sort of wrap up, I think, convener. I'm not sure where we're on that. Yeah. Um, first of all, just, just to be clear, non-domestic rates are a, a tax that's been around for the best part of two centuries, 150 years, um, on the rateable value of property. It's a property tax. Um, do you agree that every property occupier of non-domestic property should pay, in principle, something because the local services assist you. They provide the roads to your schools and all the rest of it. You agree with that in principle? Yeah. All I would say is that the, the Barclay Review said that the, the taxes are there to raise money for education. Well, so the ta the ta you have to net gain that, you, that, that, of course, we want to pay our way. But the tax... The, the, the non-domestic non rates... They didn't say for education. They said including education. Right, thank you. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Non-domestic so, rates yeah. are a source of local government revenue to pay for all the services that local government provides, uh, social services, everything. Um, but obviously they provide critical... You, your schools could not exist in, an, in isolation. You need the roads maintained, you need the sewerage and all the rest of it. So as a matter of principle, you agree that non-domestic... All non-occupiers of non-domestic property should pay something. Currently you pay 20%. Yeah. You agree with that? That's fine. So what I want to explore is... Um, The argument is that this is a rather blunt instrument, um, just taking away the 80% relief. Do you have any other suggestions about how... Um, I mean, Bar Barclay's argument in the report was that independent schools that are charities benefit from reduced or zero rates bills, whereas council schools do not qualify and generally will pay rates. This is unfair and that inequality should end by removing eligibility for charity relief for all independent schools. That is Barclay's argument. Um, I don't think that argument has changed. I think that's the government's argument as well, but we'll give the government the chance to tell us what it is. On the basis that there might be some change, it may not be the complete removal of mandatory 80% relief. It could be in making non-domestic rates more, more progressive. There are flat tax at the moment, 48 pence. Uh, you could have tax-free amounts and 10% and 20%. Uh, we could do something about phasing it in over a number of years. We could do something about... Um, it's not 80%, it might be 40%. 
Um, last week, people have talked, and it's important for people on the, on the record to know that we visited George Watson's, and some of the references we've made are to conversations that were held last week in private. But it, um, it was interesting to me when the, the schools there told me what the school role was, how much the proposed taxes would cost them and what that meant per pupil. So we had like Watson's and indeed Hutchinson's yourself, I think you've got 1,300 pupils or so. So that would be £246 per pupil. Watson's £191 per pupil, but for the smaller schools like Hamilton College, 450 For Colgraston, 500 So there's an issue about scale here. Uh, and also there's a question about your property, because this is being charged on your property. Are some of your schools inefficient users of property and you could rationalise your estate and possibly reduce your non-domestic rate bill. So just so any general ideas on if we wish to address this unfairness, and I know you don't agree it is an unfairness, we'll take that as read, what else could be done? I, I would have thought personally, and this is just an opinion of course, that what needs to be done is a calculation needs to be made for charities about what would be a fair level of support that they should make to, to their rates. And then that should be applied to charities. So the wrong that is the 20 that's the 20%. And if that's wrong, if that's too low, then charities. And but what I would propose is that you should bring back the state schools to the same level. That that is, you make a, you, you devise a formula that says for a charity or a state school, this is what they should pay, rather than full rates to a state school, which makes no sense at all. The head teachers need that money. It should not be being paid in rates to raise money for things including education. Okay, but another... a, a, a formula would be, I think, the fairest way across the sector. I mean, I think, sorry. Go ahead. Thinking slightly out, out of the box here, um, I, my own personal philosophy is that I, I wondered, and, and forgive me, Martin, for uh, I, I wondered why nobody suggested in England apparently a, a level of bursaries uh, per independent school five percent was uh, over five percent was balked at by by and challenged in England through the courts, I believe. But it, I wondered if there was any scope for. Um, Whatever it may be per independent school in Scotland, whether it be six, eight percent that's deemed acceptable, plus public benefit being apparent in the function of that school, a lift in that percentage would help all concerned. So, just take for example, if there was an expectation uh, when the Charities Commission were carrying out their their inspections that if independent schools were expected to give up ten percent of their uh, of their income, then all of a sudden that's going to slightly alleviate pressures on on oversubscribed state schools. Or, and and actually, most schools in Scotland, most independent schools, would um, would accommodate that. Uh, would be able to accommodate that. Accommodate it if you're telling us that they're under a huge financial pressure just now. Because, well, it, it, half a fee would help the bottom line, as opposed to uh, no fee at all. Okay. Okay. In, terms, in terms of rates themselves, I mean, um, you're completely right. And of course, no, I, although Barclay suggested it, I don't know of any of our schools that pay no rates at all. Maybe possibly some of the special schools get full discretion from their local authority, but certainly none of the mainstream schools pay no rates at all. Um, so you're absolutely right that it should be um, part of their, their, their role in society. I mean, I think the, the, the trouble that the schools have had is that they've... Um, in, in contributing that money and the, the, the charity test is there, they're now stuck between uh, what do we do to maintain our situation as a school? And, and I take your point about facilities, but I mean, uh, there's no bursars on this panel, but if you ask a bursar whether their facilities are well used, they will say they are extremely overused. Um, well used. I was talking about whether their property is efficiently managed, well, whether they might have too much property, well, indeed, and that's why they have a high indeed, rateable value. Which, which comes back to the, ultimately the question about where do you pay uh, if, 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 if rates go up, where does the money come from? The money comes from parental fee income, and there is, there is independent evidence that shows beyond a certain point, affordability cuts in and people start to leave, and each one of them is, on average, 6500 back to the state. The other two places to get that money are to sell off assets, and that may be rugby pitches or hockey pitches or whatever, or land or boarding houses, uh, or you get rid of staff, none of which I suspect I presume in the ideas of increasing physical activity and improving attainment in Scotland is something that anybody wants. So there, is, there, there are no other ways of generating that income. 
Um, and if you start to sell off the fact the, the buildings, you're you're in problem. We we sit under the shadow of a former school that for 60 years has sat letting in the water because it's a grade one listed building that nobody can do with. We have in both the mainstream and the special needs sector 17 grade one listed buildings. Um, I know one school here in Edinburgh that spent a million pounds on roofs in the last two years. So they are making their contribution and keeping those facilities going, but I don't think any of them would feel that they can... That there are a lot of houses in Edinburgh, Glasgow and elsewhere built now on former playing fields. I think the most of them would think they don't want to go any further in that area. And a specific example, Hutchie, we've got some rugby pitches, but we rent them from the council, and they're a floodplain, so they're not really fit for purpose, so we maintain them, we keep them looking lovely, we play sport on them, but uh, I think you know our lease is up for renewal in, in the next few years, and I, you know, so it's not something that we own. For Mr Tyson, you, I mean, Oscar believe, is it the case quite strongly that you want to retain the integrity of the charitable sector and therefore the reliefs associated with it as one sector. And I, and I think, you know, um, just sort of meditating on your, your previous question, I think that what we would want to see there is is uh, a way of looking at, at that question that uh, looked at it on that basis of principle, on the basis of, of you know, how charity law is uh, and, you know, that, that, that does bear in mind the integrity of the sector. Thank you very much. Uh, does anybody have any last final questions? But we're just at the time. Okay. In that case, thank you for, very much, panel, for today's session. That was very, very useful indeed. I'm going to suspend briefly to allow a witness change over for the next panel. Thanks again.
Okay, for today's second evidence panel on the Non-Domestic Rates Scotland Bill, I'd like to welcome Cheryl Hind, Customer Manager Transactions and Fiona Law, NDR Team Leader, City of Edinburgh Council, Brian Morrison, Revenues Manager at the Highland Council, and Jack Orr, Senior Property Executive from West Lothian Council. Thank you for all your submissions. Uh, and I'll just kick off with the... Uh, I wonder if you could tell us whether you feel the bill is drafted, along with the early measures implemented by the Scottish Government, sufficiently address the findings and recommendations made by the Barclay Group? Would anybody like to be the first to dip their toe in the water? Happy to respond to that. I think, Thank you, Mr. Um, yes, uh, I think in broad terms, uh, the bill is drafted in lots of respects. Uh, with regard to the main recommendations of the Barclay report. Uh, as ever with these things, the, the devil is in the detail to some extent. Um, and I think that having looked at the, the bill uh, in that respect, there are a few points of detail. And I think that's why we've been invited along here today uh, to perhaps elaborate on some of these detailed aspects of the bill. Very much. Does anybody else have any further comment? Like that? no, That's good. Sorry, we just concur that we feel it's a work in progress, and as I say, the detail is something needs to be ironed out. What about your? Uh, do you have any views on the recommendations the Scottish Government rejected? The 28 recommendation to 28 all properties should be entered in the valuation role, except public infrastructure, uh, and current exemptions should be replaced by 100% relief to improve transparency. And recommendation 29 that large scale commercial processing and agricultural land should pay the same level of rates as similar activity elsewhere so as to ensure fairness. Do you have any strong views on, on these? No? Okay, well, listen, can I ask you? Uh, you'll have heard some of the previous debate, and one of the things that kept on coming round again was uh, round about schools, particularly, but I mean, the, how the non domestic rates works within the state system. I wonder if somebody could give us a uh, as a sort of easy to understand explanation about how this how the non domestic rate system works within the state system. Chair, I'm, I'm happy to um, just give a, a, a brief view from my own view in West Lothian. Um, all of our schools are subject to the valuation process, and all of our schools, that's secondary, primary, and nursery, uh, as well as special schools. Um, are all eligible to pay, to pay uh, rates as per the rateable value that's entered in the valuation rule. Um, there are certain exemptions uh, or exceptions from that through various reliefs, and the most obvious of these uh, are some of the special schools where there are reliefs granted for uh, physical and other disabilities. Um, so these schools um, uh, do get an element of relief from that. Um, otherwise, uh, everything that's in the valuation rule uh, is charged. Um, and um, I don't have it split down into uh, individual uh, schools, but uh, the total non-domestic rates paid by West Lothian Council last year um, was £8.7 million. Um, of that, um, some £2.9 million uh, was paid in respect of primary and nursery schools. The remainder is made up of the other schools, which by far form the largest part of our estate, together with other operational buildings. Um, I think just to put some context on the total bill, the £8.7 million for non-domestic rates, um, that slightly exceeds uh, what we pay for all of our energy and all of our estate. Um, and as a proportion of our total revenue budget, uh, our property revenue budget uh, is somewhere between 23 and 24 million pounds. Um, so it's a substantial percentage or proportion of that total sum. Do you have any other comments on that? Check it. I guess for Edinburgh, just to put it in context for ourselves, um, the total non-domestic rate bill as of March just finished, it was £19.3 million, of which £12 million was for schools, and it is a considerable amount of money. So it was interesting to see 
discussions from colleagues in the private sector also to get a balanced approach. And um, I think reading some of their ideas and their submissions, the fact that everybody's willing to have a conversation and by no means is this all set in stone, it goes towards the ethos as far as we're concerned of the Barclay Review, that we're, it's up for discussion and people's thoughts and views are actually taken forward because it might just be a number on a bit of paper, but it's people's lives this does affect. And, and can we just, I suppose, clarify for the record that uh, all that money doesn't get recycled back into the education system? No. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Graham, you wanted to come in briefly, and then Alec, you. It, it, it's really just to clear the clear this whole thing up. Um, so who who is actually paying the money, and where's it go? Where where's it being paid to? Um, it, it, is it individual schools? If that rates bill goes up, does that affect any head teacher? It's a central process whereby the money is just taken from a service budget. It's a top line service budget. So the, the head teacher will, will not, in many cases, not even be aware that they pay rates for that building. The case for all of you? Yeah. Yes, Jim. So it's a set budget at the um, beginning of the year. So you'll know the rateable value of your property role. Um, obviously, for Edinburgh, that includes all of our buildings, whether it's um, for a secure unit or a library, etc. So you know the central costs for your council, which is why I started off by saying it's 19.3 million in total for us. Um, so that is an overhead, and it has to be part of your considerations for your budget. You, you, you know you've got to pay your bill and whatever um, funding that you have as an authority, that's taken into account. Record, so that people understand this, every council is handing over that money to, to the government? To itself. Okay. Mr Whiteman is saying to itself. Well, they accept it's different things, isn't it? Councils okay. on themselves. Um, Obviously, you've got your council tax and you've got your non-domestic rates and then there will be some grants, etc., from central government. So the money that we get as councils have to pay for all of the services, etc., and staffing costs. Could I just I mean, I'm going to move on to other things, but before I move on, can I just ask, is any of your authorities represented here today have set up alios in order to avoid paying rates or is, 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 has, you, have you set up alios where the non, not having to pay rates has been a saving to the council? Um, council operates an alio but as I say I wouldn't have said it was set up to avoid rates. No. <laughs> but, but as a, a consequence it uh, avoids rates. The consequence is that yes as a, yeah. as a charitable yeah. organisation they, they get the 80% relief. Okay, can I move on and then just, just um, whether there are additional measures uh, that could have been included in the bill. So one that, that, that comes to mind is the, the changes to rates for out-of-town shopping centres. I actually want to try and focus a bit on town centres in this part uh, and the impact of town centres on rates, but... Is there anything in the, that's not in the bill that you think could have been put into the bill that could have helped councils and helped town centres? I take it that's a no. I think in, in terms of, you mentioned um, out of town uh, shopping centres and the like, clearly they are already in the role. Um, and they are in direct competition with traditional town centres. And there's generally, uh, in my view, only one winner. Uh, and that tends to be the out of town shopping centres because of their convenience and all the rest of it. So there are a few town centres, and I can think of uh, places like perhaps Bridge of Allen, where there's a good range of uh, shops, independent shops, and the like. Um, but I suspect. Uh, certainly in West Lothian, speaking from my own experience of our town centres, um, over the years they have become um, homes for 
in many cases, things like charity shops, um, many of the multiples that we used to have, for example, people like Woolworths and um, Pound Stretcher, I think it was, and people like that, uh, have um, failed and, and, and gone into liquidation, and that hasn't helped. Um, coming back to your question, is there anything that should have been in the bill or could have been in the bill um, to, to uh, help redress that balance? Um, it, it's perhaps difficult in terms of uh, the bill itself, but I, I think in general terms, the only way to do that is to try and incentivise um, town centres in some way, whether that's through further reliefs in terms of um, the, the, the rateable values being um, reduced in some way, either through, as I say, specific reliefs um, or some other measure. Um, that's very difficult, but I think there are all sorts of intractable problems if you start to go down that road as well in terms of um, comparing one scenario with another. Am I, am I right in saying the Community Impairment Bill gave councils authority if they so wished, they now have the powers that they could make a, a town centre rate free, but they would have to pay for it? It's self-financing. It's self-financing? Yeah, well, the, the authority would have to finance any relief scheme, which obviously, you know, would have difficulties on budgets, pressures, etc. And has any of your authorities looked at that? We have looked at it, um, but due to financial constraints, mm -hmm. we haven't been able to offer any form of relief. Right. Right. OK. Um... So the role of the assessors and local authorities, potential application of discretionary relief to restricted sports clubs. What's, is there any, I mean, playing fields seem to come up as, a, as an issue uh, in this bill, concerns around playing fields. And is, is, it, is there changes there that, that give a threat to, to businesses running cafes or whatever in, in public parks? The difficulty we saw that the ones that we were aware of in close proximity, they were, we felt they would be so small in value that they would be entitled to the small business bonus and such you're just creating an administrative burden. The net gain would be very limited. Chair, uh, uh, sorry, Mr Rowley, I would, I would uh, concur with that view. We uh, in West Lothian, we already have uh, a number of in individual entries for some of our public parks, uh, things like cafes and, and shops and caravan sites and the like. Um, it's in some ways difficult to see um, without incurring uh, a burden, an administrative burden or whatever, how you might then bring other uh, activities into, um, into the valuation role. Um, we have an interesting scenario at the moment where on one of our country parks we're proposing or we have a proposal in front of us uh, for someone from someone who wants to do a, if you will, a winter wonderland which would be sort of modelled along the um, enchanted forest, is it, at, at Pitlochry. Um, and so uh, clearly in terms of that, it's probably a... A, a thing focused on Christmas. So it would be very much time limited. It's not something that would be there all year round. And I, I suppose that might be the kind of thing that that could uh, attract some sort of um, some sort of entry or some sort of look from uh, the assessor to see whether it would be appropriate to put something like that in the role. Um, but other things that are de minimis, whether it's a, an archery club or um, an ice cream stance or something like that, uh, which are seasonal, I think they speak for themselves, really. Will be Edinburgh, is there any? Certainly from, from Edinburgh's point of view as a capital city, um, if you were to look at, say, the, the Christmas market, 
um, in, in Princess Street Gardens, they currently don't go on the roll at Christmas. If you were to do that, would you then deter these things from happening? Which, if you look at the tourist attraction at that time, it would then be detrimental to the other businesses in the area as well. So, yeah, you would need to weigh up. Just finish on this, convener, and just ask, yeah. is there anything that, that we could be looking at in this bill to try and help town centres? I mean, town centres up and down the country are just struggling, most of them. And, and you know, as David will know, being the MSP for Kirkcaldy, it's, it's, it's not easy to see what the answers are. Any thoughts on that? No? No. I'd... I mean, the, the, the main issues we have with town centre businesses are the two issues, one being the rate of value, but that's an assessor's matter. And, and it's driven, in effect, by non-retail businesses that are willing to pay that rental value within a town centre. And obviously, the other one, the issue with off, as out of town centre is the parking issues. But we're obviously trying to address those offering free parking within town centres for a limited period. Okay. Okay. Chair, we, um, convener, rather, we, we just for the record, we, we have no parking charges in West Lothian in any of our towns at the current time. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, Andy? Thanks very much, um, convener. I'm just wondering if you've made any evaluation of the impact of moving to a three-year valuation revaluation cycle um, on the, um, the administration of non-domestic rates within your councils? Um, in, in our own case, certainly, as far as I'm aware, we, we haven't uh, specifically modelled that um, from a property perspective. Um, clearly, that's something that we would be supportive of because it would help to iron out the large swings that can take place um, at revaluation, particularly the last revaluation has been seven years in the making uh, and during that time the property market has fluctuated widely for a number of reasons. So anything that helps to iron out these fluctuations for um, ratepayers in general, businesses in particular, um, has got to be seen as welcome. Um, and I also think that in terms of the uh, tone date being reduced from the two years in advance of the revaluation to the one year. Um, will also help that particular uh, situation. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is more a question really for assessors um, as such, but I'm just wondering if there are any other impacts for councils. Well, there will be impacts, as in we often use revaluation years to uh, review reliefs that are awarded, particularly small business bonus, rural relief, and obviously there will be an increased impact on that. Uh, I mean, we have an automated interface with assessors, but we will still get manual rejections, which you will have to deal with. So, yes, there will be an increased workload, but it's something that you know, we just would have to manage. Sorry, Mr Whiteman, I should have said that, of course, there is a, an obvious impact for uh, certainly property people within local authorities, and that is that we will be involved in appeals every three years rather than uh, every five years. So there's an obvious impact there from our day-to-day -day working. So you'd be involved in appeals? Yes, because um, the local authorities generally, I can't think of any local authority which wouldn't appeal uh, where it uh, sees it as appropriate to do so against revaluation um, valuations uh, throughout its authority. So okay. we, we, we act, uh, actively manage these uh, in-house, as it were, uh, with some external assistance. So do local authorities um, lodge quite a number of appeals. I'm just thinking because they, the non-domestic rates that you pay as local authorities goes straight to your local authority. So why would you bother appealing? Um, in terms of uh, to, to ensure that our assessments are fair uh, in the round with everyone else, um, we don't want to be in a position where we feel our assessments, our uh, entries and evaluation or our rateable values uh, are significantly different from the rest of uh, the market, if you like. OK, can I turn to the question of parks? Because um, it seems the intention of the, the bill is to make sure that commercial activities 
in parks are not um, exempted unnecessarily and that there's parity between what goes on within parks of a commercial nature that is similar to what goes on out with a park. Um, are you comfortable with the provisions as they are in the bill and do you think they have, um, do you think they're justified? For Edinburgh, it's mainly around consistency of approach and making sure that across Scotland it is applied in the same way. Because I think a lot of our comments throughout the bill have been from an administrative point of view as well as a ratepayer's point of view that it needs to be consistently applied. Um, our concern would be if you've got someone who is on um, is using it. West Lothian Council or Highland or Edinburgh, regardless of um, which council they're using, any exemptions, discounts, reliefs, etc., would all be applied in the same way. It's just about the consistency and making sure that people um, know exactly what the regulations are. Okay, because I know, I mean, I've had a quick look at Prince Street Gardens, I can't find. Um, I mean, I note that the, the Scott Monument is listed as a distinct uh, historic building, for example, and that uh, St Andrew's Square, uh, which I think many members will be familiar with in Edinburgh, there's a Costa Coffee um, with a rateable value of 42,000. So it seems that there is already premises within parks that's already on the roll. This new provision appears to be about making sure that all that should be, particularly in local authority parks, are. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, if that's the intention, then um, I, I think we would welcome that. As I said, in, in, in West Lothian's case, we have a number of commercial activities which are already on the roll that are within our public parks. Um, if uh, the, the intention is to treat that consistently, consistently across the board, then uh, we would certainly agree with that. And, and just as colleagues from Edinburgh were saying, um, if it's applied across the whole country, then that would uh, appear consistent and fair to everyone. Okay, thanks. Can you? Okay, right, thanks very much, Andy. Uh, Graham? No, I'm okay. you, you fine, mate. Right, thanks very much. Uh, David, you had a couple of questions you wanted yeah. to ask. Thank you, convener. And uh, good morning, still, the panel. The anti avoidance measures in the bill especially around empty homes, uh, holiday homes, empty properties, holidays home. Do you think these measures are strong enough to uh, close that uh, loophole? I think there are movement towards it, but I think as practitioners we can say that we feel that certain ratepayers will just find a new way around it. I think it'll just be a constant movement, but they're certainly a help. Uh, they're welcome. They're very welcome. It's giving us an opportunity to close some of them. But we feel that a lot of it will come down to case law in the end. Is there any measures you would like to see in it to close these loopholes? One of the things that we have put forward um, in our feedback is a review panel. So whether it would be through councils or the Institute of Revenue and Rateable Valuation, that um, as practitioners we get together and we discuss the loopholes as they're calling them and any new ones that come up it's about discussing as a professional group what's happening what the best way of dealing with those things should be and um, keeping an abre abreast and if there's analysis that comes through um, a caseload from a particular council that pinpoints something that's happening you can use it as a learning tool to be able to address and put forward amendments to legislation, etc. So it's about constantly reviewing things and not just saying this is, you know, this is we've, we've addressed it through the Barclay review. Let's leave it. Um, it's making sure it's kept fresh and that there are um, committees or panels put in place to review things to make sure that all potential future loopholes are looked at. It's it's consistency and fairness and making sure that we all approach things in the same way. Um, in previous ev evidence, Phoenix companies have been mentioned to uh, 
created for uh, tax avoidance, it's not covered in the bill. Um, do you think it should be? Or is there any cases that examples of Phoenix companies operating in your area? got a particular issue at the moment. Uh, it's not so much a Phoenix company. We've moved on. It's shell companies, where companies have been created purely to sort of absorb debt. And again, through the IRRV, my colleague has explained, we did a survey throughout Scotland, and this particular range of companies owe something like £2 million in outstanding rates throughout Scotland. And we have recently, well, we are going to court uh, they've taken us to court because they disagree with what we've done, but hopefully that will allow us to raise it. But in many cases, that's what we have to do, is basically be challenged under the, the sort of court system before we can get a decision. What we'd like to see is some sort of link between these spurious directors and the companies and the actual owners of the properties, whereas the properties are being bought up by owners, but it's shell companies who are operating the properties on their behalf. Yeah, no, yeah. You wanted to come in here. Um, I'm sure if you if you're willing to name that this organisation that you're they, they go under a variety of names. Um, predominantly, you'll have about four or five, I would think, in Edinburgh under okay. various Tartan House of Scotland, Kashmir. Uh, Enterprise. Yes. So I mean, they have a range, but if you trace it back, that they have a single director who is a 78-year-old gentleman from Edinburgh, who I'm quite sure is unaware that he's a single director. Okay. And in in previous evidence we heard on this topic, I suggested that um, the problem there is that you're trying to track occupiers, and it's occupiers who are liable, whether they're a tenant or an owner. Is there a case for revisiting? the liability for rates and placing it on owners rather than occupiers. That was actually a suggestion we made at the Barclay Review, was we make it an owner's tax and the owner is responsible and if the, the occupier is therefore a, a charitable organisation or various others who may be entitled to some sort of relief, that that relief is claimed through the owner. So it was one of the suggestions Highland Council did make. So yes, we are fully in favour of that. Were, were other councils, do you know? I'm not aware. I think, the, the, Mr Whiteman, the, the, the difficulty that I can see there is, uh, yes, you can make the owner responsible for the tax, but um, through commercial leases and all the rest of it, that ownership will then be uh, transferred to the lessee or the occupier. And I wonder if, I suppose, by a circuitous route, it then gets back to being a shell company. Um, and so you almost end up with the shell company again uh, through the commercial leasing aspect of, say, that um, that situation uh, being responsible for uh, payment of rates. Now, if there was something that, that then could be done to reflect on that and cast that responsibility back to the owner, then that would be a way of capturing it, but I cannot think what that would be. Okay, that's that's a very interesting point that's just been raised there. Uh, Alexander. Thank you. Can, can I talk about the potential impacts of the bill? Because COSLA have, have indicated that the financial memorandum uh, that is it's probably reflective of the figures, uh, uh, but there would be room for sort of refinement in years to follow. So can I ask whether additional costs for local authorities will be fully funded, including any additional costs that are higher than the, the estimations that come from the financial memorandum. Do you have a view on that? I mean, we, we have obviously got an estimate of initial costs such as software change and so on, but until we see what, how the bill progresses, we really it's difficult to make an, an adjustment for that. And the biggest administration would normally be for the assessors themselves? There certainly will be administrative changes required by the assessor. And that, that could have a knock-on effect as to how, how it's progressed and processed? Yes. And the second one is, what discussions local authorities have had and have you been involved in about the cost for future years? Uh, because this is only talking about what's going to happen initially uh, and it may have to be defined as years progress. I personally haven't seen anything for future years. That would be something that you would um, 
have to take as part of the consideration because through the learning, if you're changing anything, you need to take on board what needs to be amended to make it successful in future years. Um, I would say one thing that we're very good at as Scottish councils is sharing learning and things that we have um, shared as practitioners, um, for instance, automation with publication and on domestic rates, on websites, etc. That's, that's one thing I am actually proud to be uh, an authority employee, um, certainly through the Institute of Revenues. That's one of the things that they talk about quite um, particularly, share and learning. Um, so in relation to the non-domestic rates um, for future things, for administration, etc., it's not always going to be the case that it's going to be money. It's maybe just how to do things in a smarter way. And I guess as authorities, that's something that we've got very good at because we've had to. You've been forced into many of these situations that you've had to adapt, uh, and you will adapt in these circumstances. But but it, it still may have a, a knock-on effect on the on the personnel and the resources and the implications for them. At the minute, it's an unknown unknown. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, Andy, did you want to come in on this? No. Okay, Kenny, you wanted to come in. I mean, a lot of the things I wanted to raise have been raised, actually. Um, I mean, I think one of the issues about town centres really is hasn't been mentioned, and there's not really a lot we can do about it. But there's the issue of online shopping, and uh, I think there's an issue about how they, in some future date, perhaps get taxed by. I know the UK government is at least thinking about looking at that, but. I'm just wondering, the, the, the thing about parking in West Lothian, have you noticed that by not charging for parking in West Lothian, has that had an, a positive impact in terms of people um, not going into Edinburgh, for example, to shop? Because obviously the parking charges in, uh, in Edinburgh are horrific. Probably the people who largely go shopping in Edinburgh town centre take the train, I would uh, guess. But um, I, I think... Um, although parking in all our town centres is currently free, um, it seems to me that that hasn't of itself had a positive impact. Um, there are some of our town centres, um, thinking of places like Linlithgow, for example, where there are a good range of independent shops on the high street and the occupancy rates on the high street uh, are... Um, very high, um, but in probably the remainder of um, our traditional town centres, which were formerly associated with coal mining areas and the like, um, certainly that isn't the case. And, and I don't think that the free parking as such, uh, it, it may help in some respects, but I don't think it, it, it shows a specific positive uh, impact. Um, I think many of these spaces probably are simply used by people on a day-to-day -day basis, whether they be employees of the retail enterprises or whatever, but the, the parking, once that car's in there in the morning, it's there for the whole day. I know, I know. I mean, in, in St Andrews, for example, they have a two-hour turnaround time, so that uh, because uh, uh, studies have shown in England that if you do that, you can have a, a twenty percent increase in revenue just because people go in, do their shopping, and then they move. And bizarrely, in my own constituency in Largs, a lot of the shopkeepers were very reluctant to have something like that because they like to park outside their own shop, even though it, it means a customer can't do it. So I under, understand that. But I want to just briefly, uh, communities mention one last topic, which is compulsory sales orders. And it's certainly in my constituency, and I believe in many places in Scotland, we've got buildings that have been left derelict, particularly in town centres, but elsewhere for many years, properties. And the uh, owner, so maybe bought them for speculative or whatever purpose, uh, maybe they've looked to invest in them and they haven't had the money. Um, these people may be overseas, maybe he living here, but um, they're an eyesore and we need to do something about it. So with a compulsory sales, sales order, whereby if someone is not willing to utilise that property um, be forced to auction, do you think that would be a positive step? Um, I think there are some issues around that as well. I don't know what the criteria would be, for example, um, to assess 
MT3 uh, for, years, for example. Well, so. that, that if if there are workable criteria yeah. like that, then I think yes, I think it, it, probably all of us can think of properties in certain parts of our authorities uh, which would benefit from that. And certainly, I can think of one uh, in one of our towns um, which has been. It's an imposing building. It's been empty and vacant for probably 10 years. And it's now got various kind of shrubs growing out of it and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, in principle, um, then I, I don't see any uh, reason why that wouldn't seem to be uh, a positive move. And what would other members of the panel think about that? No, we would ex agree with that. Yeah. yeah. OK. Thank you, Camille. Yeah, Andy wanted to come in and then, David. Yeah, I just want to uh, 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 general questions about the financial memorandum to the bill. Um, so the financial memorandum estimates a cost, administrative cost to local authorities of two and a half million uh, pounds from 2020 through to 2025. Um, and it, um, it also estimates the total administrative cost of the bills to local authorities to assessors and the government is 32 million and the estimated cost to ratepayers of 68, so it's going to net raise more money. Are you broadly content with the estimates set out in the financial memorandum on the financial implications of this bill? I would say from our own point of view, from Highland, we, we certainly sat down when we were asked to estimate what we, the cost to ourselves, so I can only comment on that. Uh, but yes, I'm content with the figures that we provided. Were Opening remarks, you're saying that... I can only... I can only comment on, we sat down when we were asked to estimate the cost of the bill towards Highland, and we're talking from an administrative point of view, and I'm comfortable with the figures we provided were a fair and accurate figure of what the actual cost would be. However, Who asked you? Uh, when the bill first came out, we were asked... By COSLA, by the government? Possibly COSLA. By think, COSLA? Yes. Okay. Fine. Yeah. No, we've already asked COSLA. Also. Sorry? That goes for Edinburgh also. We, all the councils were asked to sit down and have a look at it um, and make sure that they were comfortable and they've had a chance to feed back through COSLA. So if, the, if there's any discrepancies, if, these, if, you, if, you, if you get any surprises, then um, you'll be ready for them and they'll be based on your own figures and so you'll be work out yeah. why they went to skew. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Sorry, it was just to say that, that in West Lothian we, we did the same exercise. I think to some extent uh, all I would say is that um, we had to make some fairly broad assumptions in terms of uh, what these costs might be uh, given the level of knowledge and detail that we had at that point. Okay. We have one further comment. I mean, um, Mr Orr, you wrote to us about nurseries. You did. I just want um, so that I don't know if you were here for the previous panel, but they were independent schools and they were raising the same issue that where they put a gate um, determines whether they get relief or not. This is not covered, obviously, in the bill. This has been covered by secondary legislation already. But do you think we should revisit this question in the context of this bill? Uh, convener, can I answer that, that question in terms of I understand that um, You've been circulated with plans uh, that I've supplied. Um, the, 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 the reason for my raising this was because of the current uh, nursery relief provisions uh, that are already uh, in place. And um, I did hear some of the evidence latterly in the previous hearing. Um, and I can only speak from my own authority's point of view. Um, in terms of the, the reliefs and the um, provision of the relief, uh, I think uh, the regulations are um, to provide 100% non-domestic rates relief uh, from the 1st of April 18 until the 31st of March 2021 for properties wholly or mainly used as day nurseries within the meaning of the Education Act. Um, and I think m my reason for writing on that was to point out, I don't know whether it's a, an anomaly or an unintended consequence uh, of the regulations, 
But if I can perhaps give you some figures to illustrate um, where I'm coming from. Um, West Lothian Council currently has 58 nurseries, um, which range from a total capacity of 140 places in one instance uh, and reduced from that, but generally a uh, capacity of 40 places or thereabouts. So the 58 West Lothian Council nurseries. Um, the bulk of these are contained within uh, school um, campuses, if you like. So they're associated with, they are the feeder nurseries for individual primary schools and, and so forth. Um, and because of that, um, and the way that they are presented on the valuation roll, um, of the 58 uh, nurseries that we record, uh, only two are eligible currently uh, for the nurseries relief. Um, and that comes back to, as I say, the fact that they are included as uh, what we call a unum quid on the valuation roll. So it, it doesn't give us the ability to claim those reliefs. In terms of the number of places, um, that represents across the authority uh, something like a total of just under 4,000 nursery places. Um, in terms of the reliefs currently uh, within West Lothian, uh, I mentioned that the Council, West Lothian Council, currently uh, only qualifies for two nursery schools which get relief. Um, and there are a total of 26 nurseries which currently uh, are eligible for the reliefs. Um, so the other 24 of those are from the private sector. And these are kind of standalone buildings um, specifically for day nurseries. And the point of sending you the, the um, plans was to illustrate how in many cases, um, not all, but in many cases, uh, our nurseries are actually self-contained buildings within a larger school campus. Um, and that seems to me to be, um, on the face of it, iniquitous that uh, standalone nurseries elsewhere are eligible for these reliefs, but because of the way that we use our estate, and this is all about efficiencies in terms of education and so on, that that is denied to us uh, for that reason, just in terms of being a property tax or a property be, So to be clear, I mean, this bill just deals with the Barclay recommendations that require primary legislation. The Barclay re re recommendation on nurse relief didn't require it, so the government just did it did secondary legislation. Would you like us to revisit that in the context of this bill? Um, I, I think I would. Uh, speaking from my own council's point of view, I, I don't know about my colleagues here. I suspect that um, much of what I've said applies to other authorities within Scotland. Um, and it's been a, a fairly constant theme throughout the hearing that you have been asking, is there anything else that should be considered within the bill? So I think my answer to that would be yes. Okay, thanks, Commissioner. Yes, we've also been asking to use your estate wisely. It seems strange that you're using your estate wisely and being penalised for it. So uh, it's certainly something that we should be, we'll, we'll discuss after in the private session later on. Okay, right, thank you. David, you wanted to come in? Just a quick look, You mentioned free parking across West Lovian. How much does that cost the council to do that? Because I know that's something that's restricted five council in implementing it in areas like Kirkcaldy. So how much... How much does it cost for your free parking? Because you've got maintenance, ah, but you've got maintenance of these car parks and everything like that, and where we have multi stories. So a lot. I think um, in terms, I'm trying to think. Actually, we don't have any multi stories that aren't associated with, say, Livingston Town Centre, which are in private ownership. So our uh, car parks are surface car parks uh, and on street parking. Um, I can't, unfortunately, give you the maintenance figures for uh, the surface car parks, but inevitably there are, and there are also rates paid on these yeah. surface car parks yes. as well. Uh, there's no rates paid on the street side parking, but on the surface car parks. But I don't have that figure, unfortunately. Do you have a... a, a you must have done some calculations about 
lost income? Or? Well, um, we uh, until uh, a few weeks ago, um, and for the previous. 20 years, one of our car parks, the only one uh, in the authority uh, in, in Linlithgow, uh, centre of Linlithgow, was let uh, to a private car parking company. And uh, the reason for that was that uh, until 1995 or thereabouts, uh, it became used as a commuter car park. So people would park up there uh, of a morning, walk along to the station and go to wherever they were going to. Um, and our transportation people at that time, and I appreciate it's many years ago, uh, took the view that we should uh, go for some form of uh, short-term parking, the, the, the two hours, if you like, in St Andrews being uh, the, the obvious comparison. Um, so similarly, uh, that was the principle that was employed there. Um, we decided to put it out to the private sector because we didn't have the expertise or resources necessarily in-house um, to, to do that ourselves. Um, at two effects, first of all, um, it very quickly removed the commuter aspect from the parking. Uh, and secondly, um, it uh, provided us with a commercial income of uh, around £40,000 per annum. Uh, and thirdly, uh, it made the lessees uh, responsible for payment of non-domestic rates. So it was a win-win-win situation uh, from the Council's point of view. So why then... So, sorry, David. No, right. no. So, so, so why then did you scrap the parking charges if there was income coming in and it's not had any positive impact on the town centres? We, uh, the, the, the tenancy came to an end at the end of uh, May uh, and the current uh, car parking operator uh, decided not to renew uh, and relinquish their tenancy at that time. Uh, we currently have it on the market and we already have expressions of interest uh, to do the same thing again uh, in that particular location. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if nobody else has any other questions, then can I thank the panel once again for uh, their, their evidence today? That was very useful. Further evidence sessions will take place on the bill at our next meeting on 26th of June, after which we will hear from the Minister at a meeting in September. The committee will also visit East Ayrshire on the 24th of June, and at one of our meetings there we will discuss the bill with local businesses, enterprises and charities. Uh, I now pause briefly to allow the witnesses to leave the table. Thank you very much. Agenda item three is a consideration of negative instrument 177 as listed on the agenda, and I refer members to paper number three. The instrument is laid under the negative procedure, which means that its provisions will come into force unless the Parliament agrees to a motion to annul it. No motion to annul has been laid. The Delegate, Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered the instrument at its meeting on the 4th of June 2019 and determined that it did not need to draw the attention of the Parliament to the instrument on any grounds within its remit. Do members have any comments on the instrument? Andy? I think in the circumstances it's sensible, but um, I, don't, I don't understand why personal license holders who knew there was a deadline coming up have not been getting their applications in. Um, but I think it's a proportionate response to the demands placed on licensing boards by the failure of people to apply to renew their licenses. Okay. Uh, but do, does the committee agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations? We do agree. To Agreed. And thank you very much. That ends the public part of the meeting, and I now move this meeting into private. Thank you.